Now, from the makers of Cold Water Omo. The wind was cold and bitter. It tore through the railway siding that dreary September day. The thick clusters of railway lines stretched out into the distance, looking as though they could go on forever. There were dozens of trucks loaded with coal, petrol, and livestock. But few people put about. In the signal huts, the men brewed strong tea and smacked their arms across their chests to generate some warmth. Then, running down the track towards the station, was a man. Middle-aged and out of condition, he was panting desperately. He staggered and almost fell. And then, with a superhuman effort, he reached up and wedged himself between two good trucks. He crouched back and listened. He's here somewhere, Betty. That's right. We've got to get him. Shoot on sight and shoot to kill. The Avengers. Steed and Emma Peel, The Avengers. The man squeezed between the two railway trucks, held his breath, clutched at his briefcase, and waited. The wind roared through the station. He heard snatches of conversation wafted to a truck. You take that side, I'll take this. Uh, look over the trains, could be hiding anywhere. The man guessed from the voices that it would only be a matter of time before he was discovered. He slipped from his hiding place, dashed across the track, and made for an empty wagon. Breathless and exhausted, he hauled himself into the wagon, carrying his jacket as he did so. Oh, done. I've done it. Oh. He lay face downwards in the darkness, safe at last for a while. But the search went on. The man called Freddy kicked at an empty beer can. He swore incoherently. What the devil is he at? The man in the wagon knew it was only a question of time. He stood up and quickly removed his tie, doubling it up and knotting it, prepared to use it to strangle anyone who attacked him. Freddy, moving down the line, paused. Oh, there, what's this? A length of cloth torn from a jacket. And that means he's in here. Freddy clambered into the truck, paused, and peered into the half-darkness. He reached into his pocket, withdrew a small automatic, but he had no opportunity of using it. The tie was thrown quickly around his throat. <laughs> Me or you? <laughs> you <laughs> to kill? There's no, no chance. In Mrs. Peel's apartment, John Steed had assembled a toy train on the carpet and was demonstrating the art of shunting two trains whilst allowing an express to roar around on its track. You see, Mrs. Peel, it takes a bit of working out. The express doesn't stop. The other trains have to be moved from that siding to this one. Tricky. But well, why? Huh? Well, why do we have to create the problem in the first place? Oh, it's my nephew, Willie. He's retarded. This will give him something to concentrate on. Well, if we can't do it, how can we expect a retarded child to? That's a reasonably good point. You didn't move the point, Steed. That's why the crash occurred. Well, perhaps I'd better give him something a little more simple. He, I think it would be a good idea. Oh, excuse me. Emma Peel? Mrs. Peel, is John Steen with you? Yes, yes, he is. Who shall I say is calling? Uh, Lucas. Uh, just tell him it's Lucas. Uh, it's urgent. All right. Steve, it's a man called Lucas. He wants to talk to you urgently. You right. better take it. Of course. Hello? Steve here. Steve, Mark Lucas. Look, I'm onto something big. I, I can't talk now, but you must take me off the 810 train at Norborough. Got it? The 810 at Norborough. Yes, uh, yes, I understand, Mark, but, but why... You just killed a man. And I may have to kill again. But you must help me, Steve. You must. Right. The 810, Norborough Station. I'll be there. Trouble, Steve? Sounds like it. We've got to stop playing at trains, Mrs. Peel, and start taking them. Come on. And so, some hours later, Mrs. Peel and John Steed found themselves on Norborough Station. It was still cold. Oh, this had better be important. Dragging a girl away from a fireside. I agree. I think a bed. An mm. electric blanket. I have no more idea of what it's all about than you have. I know that Mark Lucas isn't a man to over-dramatize. If he wants help, he wants help. And who exactly is Mark Lucas? 
What about senior agents? He said it was on something big and that he'll be arriving on the 810. You know, I don't really approve of them. Eh? Electric blankets. They make one so self-sufficient. Tell me more about Lucas. Well, he's a brilliant linguist. Been all over the place, all around the world. Asked about the Empire. When there was one. When there was one. Each time the Union Jack came down, he was the last person in the gunboats. Eventually, of course. There were no more gunboats. Oh, exactly. And now, instead of fighting a magnificent last stand on the banks of some tropical river, he's speeding through the home counties on a very cold Thursday. Uh, that's right. And as far as I'm concerned, he can't turn up too soon. Let's walk up and down the platform, Mrs. Peel. This may lead to monkey business. Uh, no brass monkey. Come on, step it up. <laughs> towards Norbera, Mark Lucas sat huddled in the compartment. He clutched his briefcase, swaying with the movement of the train. He was edgy, tense. Norbera! Big stop, Norbera! Norbera! The ticket collector moved along the corridor, calling the next stop. Big stop, Norbera! Mark Lucas rose unsteadily to his feet, emerged from the compartment, and moved along the corridor, following the ticket collector. It was then that he saw the man Bart approaching. This was the other man who had tried to kill him. Lucas didn't stop to think twice. He stepped sideways into the nearest compartment. It had on the door a sign which read, Just Mary. <laughs> what the devil? Oh, really? Do you mind? We have got a reserve notice on the door. I, I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I do beg your pardon. So, so sorry. Forgive me. Sorry. Lucas realized that there was no time to lose. He left the newlyweds compartment and shot into the guard van. It was empty. He hurriedly placed his briefcase amongst some luggage. The train screeched to a stop at the station. Dobra! Dobra! Lucas got out of the train. The train started up and pulled out of the station. Lucas looked about him. The rain was now falling in the wind. It was dark, deserted. Lucas pulled the collar of his overcoat up around his neck. The train faded away into the distance. Lucas realized that he was completely alone. He walked towards the shelter of the station waiting room, lighting a cigarette. His footsteps echoed out hollowly on the uneven flagstones. The lighter blew out. All was now still apart from the wind. Lucas walked the platform. The waiting room appeared derelict. Nothing happened. And then, the sound of whistling. Faint, but recognizable. The devil! Uh, hello? Hello? Who's there? Who, who is it? Who are you? Put your hands up, quickly, or this gun might go off. Come on now, do as I say. That's better. Stay like that. The train coming. Listen to it. Listen, Lucas. No, don't move. Don't move. As the train screamed through the station, the revolver shot that killed Mark Lucas was not heard. Lucas sank to the platform. The man moved over to the sign that read Norbera. He reached up and removed it. Underneath was an old battered sign. It read Chase Halt. It creaked in the wind. The rain streamed down. Lucas lay face downwards. The puddle beneath him turned to scarlet. Eventually, even the wind died. On the real Norbera station, John Steed and Emma Peel paced up and down impatiently. The train arrived at last, drew in and stopped. Ten. I don't see Lucas. You think he might have missed it? No. No, he was too definite. No one getting off at all. I think we'd better get on the train, Mrs. Bill. He may have fallen asleep. Come on. Steed and Mrs. Peel walked the whole length of the corridor, peering into each compartment. Can't see him. It's very strange. Can you see him? 
about 50, balding, six feet and rather heavy. That's right. No one like him. Very strange. What's their hunch, Mrs. Pierre? I'm trying to get them up, actually. What have you in mind? The guards, Van. The only place to have a look. What you say? I'm very intrigued by that sign that we've just married. I didn't think people were never that kind of publicity these days. Very odd. Mrs. Peel would have thought it even more odd had she heard what the bride was saying. Now, look, you get over and keep your hands to yourself, Bart. I was engaged for the job, but there are limits. Don't go getting over-enthusiastic. My husband is a very jealous man. <laughs> John Steed had taken an urgent phone call from Mark Lucas, one of Britain's top secret agents. Lucas had told him that he was onto something big, but couldn't divulge more information over a telephone. He'd requested that they meet his train at Norborough at 8.10. Steed and Mrs. Peel kept the appointment, but Lucas didn't get off the train, and so Steed and Mrs. Peel got onto it. They had searched all along the corridors, but had had no luck. Steed was quite worried, as Mark Lucas wasn't the sort of man to ask for help unless he was in a very tight spot. Mrs. Peel, still intrigued by the just married sign on the compartment door, knocked smartly and entered. Hey, beg your pardon. Oh, I'm so sorry. Wrong compartment. It has got a notice up, you know. Has it? I didn't see. Yes. Just married. We'd like to be alone, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Oh, congratulations, by the way. Bye-bye. I wonder if that notice wasn't a mistake. Seems to attract people, not put them off. You know who that woman is? Never seen her before in my life. She must have gone up Norbra. Better keep an eye out. We've got trouble enough without prying eyes. If she comes back and causes trouble, let me know, right? Right. Meantime, since it's supposed to be a honeymoon, couldn't we order just one bottle of champagne? Just for appearance's sake. Please, Bart. <laughs> restaurant car, Mrs. Peel chose a seat and looked around her. Can I help you, madam? Oh, thank you, but I'm waiting for someone. I can't understand it. This man said he'd be here ten minutes ago. Perhaps you've seen him. He's about fifty, uh, six feet, rather heavily built, going bald. No, madam, no, no. no. I've seen oh, no one like that. Can I help? Oh, lady's lost her friend. Uh, lost? Of the train? <laughs> well, your friend can't have gone far, can he? Well, he isn't actually a friend, exactly. Oh? No, he, um... Well, he, he seemed agitated, so I spoke to him, and, well, he said he was in trouble. I see. And um, what else did he tell you? Just that he was broke. That's why I lent him the money. Oh, is that so? Mm. Yes, five pounds. I gave him five pounds. So that's why you're so anxious to find it. Yes, excuse me. The ticket collector searched in his waistcoat pocket and withdrew a small bottle. He unclasped the lid and popped a lozenge into his mouth. And Mrs. Peel was suppressed a smile and raised an eyebrow. Tranquilizer. Twenty years on the railway plays a very devil with one's stomach. I'm so sorry I can't help you, ma'am. He probably gave you the slip at Norbra. Yes, that's the most likely thing. Slipped off at Norbra. That's what he must have done. The ticket collector disappeared from the restaurant car and headed to the guard's van. In the guard's van, Steed was making a quick search. There were several large packing cases and various crates. Hmm. All big enough to contain a body. Can't open up all of them. Steed turned to a large trestle table and lifted a sheet of tarpaulin. An Egyptian mummy case. How extraordinary. Steed managed to get the lid off without much difficulty. How oh, extraordinary. It, uh, just a paper bag. Mm -hmm. Sandwiches. Mm -hmm. Look rather tasty. Steed helped himself to a sandwich, munching away delightedly when the ticket collector said, Well, hmm, bread's amazingly fresh. Little sausage. It would have been more tasty on rye bread. As it happens, I prefer white bread. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I didn't realize it. What are you doing in here, sir, if I may be so bold? Well, I'm looking for someone in there. Well, he always was a mummy's boy. Well... It was at that moment that Steed noticed Mark Lucas's briefcase down amongst the luggage. Without batting an eyelid, he stooped, picked it up, and sauntered away, saying, Norbra was your only stop, wasn't it? That's right, sir. Hmm. Well, then he must still be on the train. Thank you. Steed made his way back to the restaurant car. Mrs. Peel wasn't there. 
she'd found herself an empty compartment. As Steed started to walk past, she rapped on the glass. Any luck? Well, unless he's traveling incognito as a young bride, he isn't on the train. I managed to pick this up in the guard's van. Steed dropped the briefcase down on the seat. The little leather tag had the name Mark Lucas clearly printed upon it. This means he is on the train. It was. And he's in trouble. That's standard procedure. If an agent hits trouble and has to run, he has to leave something behind, something to identify. Mm. But if this is true, then where did he run to? We know he didn't get off at Norborough. The train doesn't stop anyone else. Is the case locked? Yes. King's Cross! King's Cross! End of the line! Come on, Mrs. Steele. We'll attend to this back at my place. Excuse me, madam. Uh, a gentleman asked me to give you this. The attendant handed Mrs. Peel a five-pound note. Uh, he said to uh, apologize for the inconvenience. Bye. You know, I really must try that one a bit more often. As the train drew into the station, Mrs. Peel followed Steed along the corridor. As they passed the door with just Mary on it, Bart and his so-called bride were picking up their things. Oh, goodbye. Have a happy honeymoon. Thanks. Come on, dear, let's go. Shh. Not so fast. Do you see what that man is carrying under his arm? Just a briefcase. Mark Lucas's briefcase. Must have picked it up here on the train. What do we do? Leave this to me. Bart placed one hand underneath his coat, checking on the gun in its holster. Then, turning up the collar of his coat, made after Steed and Mrs. Peel, who were heading for a taxi bank. Watch it, Steed. The journey isn't over yet. <laughs> Department, the briefcase presented little trouble to open. Yeah. Small automatic. Wallet. A label marked 4767. Framed photo of a sweet old lady. His mother? Uh, Auntie Maud. Do you know her? Uh, Maud. M A U D. Microfilm and unciphered documents. Army issue pouch. Agents for the use of. Right. What else? 4767. Fourth of July, 67. Independence Day? Could be. Lots of papers. Take us some time to the size of these. Steve, there's other photographs here. This one, Edward Salt. He was on the train. Personal secretary to Admiral Cartney. You sure he was on the train? Yes. Who's Admiral Cartney? Big wig at the Admiralty. Might be worth looking into this while I tackle the paperwork. Hmm, shall be done. First thing in the morning. Right now, I'm going to put the kettle on for coffee. I shan't be long. Steed returned to the examination of the briefcase when... All right, I'll get it. Bart stood in the doorway, a newspaper in one hand, and behind the newspaper, a gun. Bart smiled, raised the newspaper, but Steed, sensing that something was very wrong, slammed the door shut. There was a shot. Steed waited, slowly and cautiously, opened the door. Bart fell into the room, dead. Mrs. Peel entered from the kitchen at speed. Steed, what the... Whoops. You really are going to have trouble with your cleaning lady. She must be fed up with this sort of thing. Uh, he tried to kill me. Antisocial. But you ruined his honeymoon. Huh? This man, he was on the train. Accompanied by a blushing bride. They were the ones I checked on. Mm. Let's see what he was carrying on him. Mm. What? Yeah, he was carrying a rail ticket. Chase Holt Station. What's that? About three stops down the line from Norborough. Except that nothing stops there anymore. Oh, Why? Because Chase Holt closed down years ago. I think we shall have to take yet another train journey. Don't you, Mrs. Peel? John Steed and Emma Peel had got off at Norborough Station to help Mark Lucas, a top secret agent, who was in trouble. They'd missed him at the station, but picked up his briefcase on the train back to London. 
The contents of the case were extremely interesting. Most of the papers were in code and would take Steed some time to decipher. But there was also a photograph and information on Edward Salt, personal secretary to Admiral Cartney, a bigwig at the Admiralty. Before following through on the death of Bart and making a visit to Chase Holt, Mrs. Peel dropped in at the Admiralty. Her visit had been arranged nicely. She was now a journalist. But thank you so much, Admiral, for the conducted tour. I really didn't think my readers warranted more than a junior aide. Yeah, public relations, my dear lady, are most important. You write a good piece for us and it helps recruitment and we get a better choice of men. Good job all round, what? Oh, that is true. Yes, after all, your women readers want much the same thing as we want in the Admiralty. Really? More able-bodied men, what? <laughs> uh, a few more questions. Uh, what are you, it's far away. What exactly do you do? Uh, oh, oh, dear, I do wish you hadn't asked that. But since I have... Uh, well, I'll tell you, but it does make me sound like a sort of travel agent. Me, who fought five major sea battles in the last war. <laughs> uh, still looking at it another way, it is important work. What is it? Uh, well, I take care of all the travel arrangements for VIPs, wherever they go, on land or sea. I, I, uh, I don't mind the sea bit, but oh, on land... In I... other words, if, if someone important wants to go from A to B... You make sure they're comfortable. No, more than that, more than that. I make sure they're secure. Yes. Can't have people popping off half the government, you know. <laughs> no, I have to make sure all is well and ship shape. Have to check every security arrangement. Oh, yes, which reminds me. Assault. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, pop this file back into top secret register. Yeah, good, sir. Uh, oh, by the way, sir, uh, Mrs. Hamilton called. Yes, I'll speak to her. Uh, see Mrs. Peel ashore, will you? Uh, certainly, sir. Well, thank you, Admiral, for your cooperation. Uh, pleasure, my dear, pleasure. Have uh, you seen Mrs. Peel? Good day, Admiral. Hello, you gorgeous little sailor's friend. <laughs> Where do we go to splice the main brace? Hey, you beauty, what? <laughs> it was later that day that Steed and Emma Peel got themselves to chase Holt. It was another cold and windy day. The station building was deserted and filled with cobwebs. Old weighing machines and slot machines stood amongst the piles of rubbish. The windows were filthy. There was a general air of decay. What's the smell? Old refuse, decaying timetables, sunny seaside posters. Hmm. Oh, look at this. Broken window pane and something that looks suspiciously like a bullet hole. Glass fell inward, so if it is a bullet hole... The gun was fired from the platform. Right. How did you get on with the notes from the briefcase? Did you manage to decode anything important? Well, it was a bit diffuse. It appears that Lucas had stumbled onto a plan to pop off a VIP. I couldn't say who or where. A VIP? Now, that would make a link to friend Salt. His boss takes care of all the travel arrangements for VIPs. Cartney, the amorous admiral. What was the amorous? Oh, I can tell by the way he looks. So we don't know who the VIP will be. Lucas hadn't found out when he drafted the paper. Did he say who he suspected was going to do the job? Nothing specific, just some splinter groups, fanatics. He managed to intercept some radio messages. What was that? It was as though there's someone or something in the waiting room. Steed walked swiftly across the platform and kicked in the door. Hey, hey, what's the idea? What are you doing? You're trespassing. You know that? This is my station. Your station? Well, I bought it. Well, I'm negotiating to buy it. Humble beginnings, you know. I have high hopes. One day, maybe, a mainline station. King's Cross or Waterloo? Oh, a terminus, yes. That's what I've got to set my heart on. You mean you live here? Oh, that's right. Well, isn't it noisy? <laughs> well, does a Venetian complain of the sound of water? Oh, I didn't realise it was quite the same thing. <laughs> my name is Crewe. I live in the signal box down the line. Do trains ever stop here? Oh, not for the past nine years. Are you always here? Always. Were you here last night? Well, of course. You sure? Yes, 100%. Whoa. Why do you ask? Answer my question first. Well, uh, last night. Yes, yeah, I had a phone call from um, uh, the, a dealer with an 1892 water system. Jubilee commemorative issue. Mint condition. Now, at a price quoted, it was a giveaway. Absolute giveaway. Did you get it? No, no, no. When I got there, it was a practical joke. It was a final insult. I missed the last train and had to take a bus. A bus, I asked. Yeah. Oh, hey, fresh, get on, son. Oh, his name's Watkins. Wilson, very nice fella. Yeah, I got a good feel for playing to Wilson. Well, it's a pity about old Tate Holt, but then, uh, I'll look after it best I can. 
So I wrote to the Queen, but she didn't answer. Oh, I must have got the wrong address. Uh, loco spiders, are you? Loco? Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. why not drop it in the signal box for some refreshment? Uh, well, some other time. Oh, well, shoot yourself. I must get on now. As the old man turned away, a long parcel wrapped in sacking crashed to the floor. Oh, God, practical jokers. Hey, who would I found in the ladies' waiting room? The old man unwrapped the sacking. Steve and Emma Peel found themselves looking down at a nameplate, Norborough. Station nameplate, Norborough. Is this station identical with Norborough? Oh, yes, yes. Well, in almost every detail. It's the uh, Scott Simon design. He was the architect, you see. Oh, there's about uh, a couple of dozen of them up and down the country. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. Oh, um, 4767... Does that mean anything to you? Mm, no, no, I can't say it does. Well, I must be getting along. Here, bye for now. You think he's involved? Very really involved. He's obsessed with a bit of a plain loco. A nameplate. The two Norbers for the price of one. See, you were saying something about Lucas intercepting some radio messages. Yes, from their HQ, wherever that is, Lucas couldn't get a fix. As soon as he beamed in on their transmissions, they moved away. Packed up the whole HQ. Doesn't make sense. Steed had been wandering about the untidy waiting room. He walked across to a large toolbox, which read, In case of fog, he opened it. I don't see how an HQ could be moved all that easily. Well, perhaps Lucas will fill in all the gaps when we find him. No. No, I don't think that's possible, Mrs. Peel. Look. Mrs. Peel moved across and looked into the tool chest. Lucas? Yes. Shop. Except poor Lucas. Maybe this was their headquarters. The oldest established permanent floating headquarters. From one derelict railway station to an arm. Could be. What now? Well, first we'll get poor Lucas discreetly moved, and then we'll get some insult of the Admiralty some information. Some homemade information. Hmm. If she is the leech, and it's almost certain he is, then... Well, we'll just see where he takes that information. Exactly. We'll put some salt on his tail, in fact. Come on. Later in the Admiralty, the Red Scrambler phone rang. Uh, Admiral Carter, our end. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Certainly. Salt? Uh, yes, sir. So right there. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, sir, Rodney. I've got your coded signal in front of me. Periscope photographs. Yes, yes, yes I like it. Like it very much. Photographs, sir. Uh, thank you. Oh, yes, sir, Rodney. Oh, this is a scrambled call, isn't it? It can't be too careful. Look, um, the chief of the general staff retiring. There's a collection. Oh, to tell me, what do you think? Ten shillings or go mad and give him a pound? Huh? Yeah, okay, yes, yes. I just wanted to clear it with you. Yes, yes, I've got that. Don't worry. Top security. <coughs> well, Salt, action at last. Top secret maneuvers. A planned tour of the enemy's offshore installation. Just and care. Hello? Does it stop at Norbra? That's the one. I'll meet you there. Right. Bye. But also boarding the train for Liverpool were a newly married couple. The girl, slipping her arm through her husband's, suddenly halted. Hey! Wait! Wait, see that man? The one in the front with the bowl and the umbrella? That's him! That's the one Bart went after. What? Sure? Bart didn't report back, did he? Missing. Believed dead. We'd better look into this, hadn't we? More trouble coming up in the rear, Steve. John Steed and Emma Peel had found the body of Mark Lucas in a disused waiting room at Chase Halt. It was clear from duplicate nameplate that read Norbera that he'd been tricked into getting off the train and had been murdered. From a thorough investigation of Lucas's papers, John Steed had managed to learn that there was to be an assassination of a VIP. What the plan was, who were the killers, and even who was the chosen victim, was still a mystery. But suspicion had fallen on Edward Salt, personal secretary to Admiral Cartney, 
and Pete had arranged to have some false information passed on to the Admiralty. It looked as though Salt had taken the bait. Steed followed him to the Liverpool train, having made sure that Mrs. Peel was fully in the picture. Salt boarded the train, entered the compartment, placed his case on the rack, and settled down behind a newspaper. Out in the corridor, Steed stopped and raised the handle of his umbrella to his lips. He clicked a small switch. A piece of the handle flew open. Steed spoke softly into the mesh of a concealed microphone. I haven't let Salt out of my sight, and so far he hasn't made any attempt to contact anyone, nor has anyone attempted to contact him. I'm going to join him in the compartment. The train's just about to leave. Chile, Barry, ticket please. Have your ticket ready, please. Oh, ticket please. First stop, over. Ticket please. Good evening. Ah, thank you. Yours there, is it? Oh, here somewhere. Oh, yes. Here we are. Thank you. Uh, there is a diner on the train, isn't there? That's right, sir. Two along the corridor. Do you do the journey often? Pretty often, yes. Salt retired behind his newspaper. The 810 to Liverpool roared on into the night. When Salt went to dine in the restaurant car, so did Steve. He returned slightly ahead of Salt and sat deliberately in the wrong seat. Oh, I, I, uh, I say, would you mind if we changed seats? Mine was reserved. I find it makes me a bit sick if I have my back to the engine. Oh, certainly not at all. As Steed moved to swap seats, he noticed the reserved note stuck above the seat. Seat four, compartment seven, carriage sixty-seven. Four, seven, sixty-seven. <laughs> in the corridor, the groom left just near the compartment and sought out the ticket collector. Their conversation was brief and straight to the point. I was just coming to look for you. That man seated in Salt's compartment. I think he's trouble. He was the man Bart went after. All right. In that case, we'd better tip Salt off about it, hadn't we? When Salt came out into the corridor to stretch his legs and have a smoke, the ticket collector drew him a little to one side. Minutes later, Salt entered the compartment again. Steed appeared to be dozing leaning heavily on his umbrella. Upon opening his eyes, he found himself looking down the wrong end of a revolver. Stay right where you are. Don't move. And don't speak. But you'd better start that tape recorder in the umbrella going, hadn't you, Steve? <laughs> on Northern Station, Mrs. Peel, having driven down at top speed, faced the platform, well wrapped up against the cold night air. In the train that was hurtling through the dark towards her, the bride and groom were talking. Well, what's the news? All taken care of, my love. All taken care of. Ah, Norbert. Mrs. Peel hastily scanned the few passengers who alighted. No sign of John Steed. She moved swiftly up the platform, stepping back hurriedly when she recognized Salt relaxing in his seat. She was about to move on when she noticed Steed's umbrella hanging from the rack. Salt left his seat and walked out into the corridor. Mrs. Peel nipped swiftly into the compartment and grabbed at the umbrella as it swung gently to and fro. Only just made it, Mrs. Peel. Later, in the just-married compartment, the bride and groom looked up as the door opened. The ticket collector entered. So it's just leaving next stop. Good. It isn't that message he brought us. Now it's from beginning to end. Not a word of truth in it. Sure. Positive. Oh, dear. He'll be going back to his office sometime tonight. In which case, I'd better be there to deal with him. Haven't I? Mrs. Peel headed for London and let herself into Steve's apartment. Lawn hope, Mrs. Peel. Now, why would Steve leave his umbrella? What did he say? An agent in trouble always leaves something behind as an identification. Let's see. It didn't take Mrs. Peel long to find the secret in the handle.
Mrs. Peel stared at the umbrella, then hurried to the phone. Within minutes, she was talking to Admiral Cartney. Admiral, Mrs. Peel, sorry to disturb you. Oh, uh, we to get a call from the lady in the evening, but uh, it's not our straight bells, you know. Look, I'm sorry, but I have to see you. It's very important and concerns the security leak and your secretary, Edward Salt. Security? What the devil are you talking about? I'll tell you when we meet. Your office in half an hour, right? <laughs> Mrs. Peel wasn't the only one to visit the Admiralty that evening. The groom had beaten Salt back to town and was hiding behind the wall drapes, waiting his time. He didn't have long to wait. Salt entered the office swiftly and made for his own desk, switching on a small table lamp and pulling out drawers. The groom moved forward, fitting a silencer onto his gun. He was whistling quietly, rather appropriately, the wedding march. What the de- You! Well, what do you want? Uh, why are you pointing that at me? What have I done? I think you've forgotten who pays you. The signal you gave us it was a fake. The HMS Pyrocanthus in Mothballed has been for years. So the general staff won't be visiting enemy installations, will they? Well, I, I got it from the Admiral. You've got to believe me. You could be right. You could be telling the truth. Well, then? In that case, it means that you are under suspicion. Sorry, sir. It's too close to the big day. Can't take risks, old boy. Sorry. Oh. Oh. The groom bent over Salt to make sure the work was complete. He was still humming the wedding march. With a smile, he took the white carnation from his buttonhole and dropped it on the body. And hurried out of the room by one door as Mrs. Peel and the Admiral entered by another. Uh, Mrs. Peel, you haven't explained that. I will, given time, I promise. If we can just search his desk, I'm sure I can find something. Hold on. There was a great shot in the air. The Admiral advanced to Salt's desk and found the body. My dear girl, I do owe you the most sincere apology. There is something going on. There was. Someone beaten us to it. Mrs. Peel stooped and picked up the buttonhole. Until death do us part. Oh, sorry, just thinking aloud. Oh, please don't. Not in that way. <laughs> Those words send a cold shiver right through me timbers. A sailor's fancy. Ah, a sailor's fancy is fancy free. I've spent my whole life avoiding the final splicing. Never dropped anchor in one port long enough to... Uh, uh, um, didn't you say you want to search the place? Admiral, is there any particular VIP about to travel anywhere at the moment? There's always a VIP about to travel somewhere. Every waking minute of the day, there's someone on the move. Why? I was just thinking. Lucas was on to something. A VIP getting popped off. Over my dead body. Well, it could be. And what's this? Uh, London to Norborough, first class return. Oh, there must be a hundred of them. Man must have had an, uh, an obsession about railways. Impertinence. Railways run on land. And to think that he used to sit in that office... Look, and... Admiral, they're all punched. Huh? See? All punched neatly through the middle O in Norbrook. Hey, blistering barnacles. I mean, I've had the holes about the size... Oh, that self-respecting microdot. Makes sense, doesn't it? Salt fills in the O with a microdot. The ticket collector clips it out. Of. And bingo, the message is passed on. Passed on to a ticket collector. The ticket collector on the Norbra run who takes tranquilizers for his stomach. Well, he's going to need them in future. That's fighting talk, Mrs. Peel. <laughs> Mrs. Peel had lost John C. In checking up on Edward Salt, she'd raced to Norbra station to keep an appointment with C. He wasn't there. Only his umbrella, swinging gently from the luggage rack. Mrs. Peel had managed to collect it and listen to the message Steed had recorded upon the secret apparatus in the handle, but it hadn't told her very much. She'd turned for help to Admiral Cartney, and they'd found Salt's body. Now, Mrs. Peel was sure she was on the right lines. Railway lines, which would take her to Chase Halt Station yet again. In the station was a train. The ticket collector opened the door. The man who was posing as a bridegroom climbed in. I'd be going. Mr. Salt is no more, and I've brought you a little cheesecake. A memento. It's Salt's mini camera. Might be useful. Good. Let's see how your worthy bride is getting along. Are you making progress? Yes. Nearly finished. The bride was working on the floor. Installing a bomb under the corner window seat. Just reassure me. How do we know that the vibration of the train won't set it off? You'll have to take my word. She has a good list of credit. It's all very fine, but never anyone is in person. 
What triggers the bomb off? A radio signal. Where will it come from? From this train. Yeah, sounds dangerous. There should be at least a mile between us. We don't want to blow ourselves up as well. We won't. At the moment it goes up, we'll be speeding away in the opposite direction. Now relax. We all have our problems. What's yours? Well, for instance, how do we get this carriage off this train and onto his train? Easy. Here's your answer. The ticket collector produced a series of very official stick labels. He showed them to the group. They all read... This carriage to be commandeered and prepared for VIP train. Very important person. Very. I'll transfer this carriage tomorrow and I'll attend to it personally. <laughs> I'll be sorry to see it go. Not to worry. You may be losing a carriage, but he is gaining a bomb. Mrs. Peel arrived at the deserted Chase Halt station carrying Steed's umbrella. She immediately went to the tool chest where they had found Mark Lucas's body and was relieved to find it empty. Far up along the platform could be heard the querulous voice of old Crewe. He was singing to himself as he went about his self inflicted oh, duty. Oh, Mrs. Peel dodged back into the shadows as she heard footsteps approaching. Oh, a man approached, hand in coat pocket, clearly touching a gun. Are you, Mr. Crew? Oh, yes. You live here? Oh, I've got a little place in my signal box. Semi detached. Here, further along the line. You live alone. Hey, what are the questions? Who are you? The man was about to withdraw his hand from his pocket when Mrs. Peel moved like lightning. She grabbed his wrist. It wasn't a gun at all. It was an identification card. Uh, Mrs. Peel, Mrs. Peel. I don't know you. George Warren, I'm a friend of Steve. Oh, yes? Then where does he buy his trilbies? He doesn't. He wears bowlers and buys them in St. James's. This is my identification card. Uh, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same thing. Ah, but I thought of it first. Special security watch all along this railway line. Oh? Someone important traveling along it? Perhaps you don't understand me, Mrs. Peel. Special security. Can't devote its details to anyone. And I mean anyone. Now then, what about you? What are you doing here? I wanted Mr. Crewe's advice on a railway matter. Oh, my experience is at your disposal, Mrs. Peel. Um, but why don't we retire to my signal box? Talk over a nice cup of tea. Splendid. Yeah. What exactly is your problem? Well, it's this umbrella. I want you to listen to it. <laughs> In the just married compartment of the train, the ticket collector faced the bride and groom. A mini camera of salts. There was a film in it. A practical place to keep a film, right there. I've just had it developed. It's details of security on this line. They're sending a special branch man to visit every station along the route. Well, so what? Don't you see that means chase halt? They'll find Lucas's body. And that means the game is up. Unless I can get to the special branch man first. When do we reach Chase Hall? Coming up in about ten minutes. The groom grinned and reached beneath the seat, producing a Tommy gun. Splendid. An unscheduled stop is indicated. Don't you think? In the signal box, drinking hot, sweet tea, Mrs. Peel demonstrated the mechanism of the tape recorder in the umbrella and said... You see, in the background is the clatter of the train. Now, is it possible for you to pinpoint the exact section of a rail which made that noise? Noise? Noise, madam? Poetry. Pure poetry. Uh, another stanza, please. Uh, look here, Mrs. Peel. This may be all very interesting, but what does it all mean? Steve's disappeared. This is the only lead I have. If I can find just where he was when he was held up, then it's a step in the right direction. Well, Mr. Crew? Well, let me hear it again. <laughs> Sounds all wrong. Yeah. There are two sets of diddly bombs. No, oh, it's impossible. A train can't be going fast and slow at the same time. You're right. Diddly bomb. Diddly bomb. Yeah, yes. You know, I don't think this part is a train at all. Just a minute, just a minute. Diddly bomb. Diddly bomb. It's the Mark V tapping curve, the sort of trick malt device so that men could communicate with each other in prisoner of war camps. Yeah, spool it back, Mr. Spear. Give it to me again. Right. Junction. 
Uh, yes. Well, Derby's Junction is on this line. Uh, nine lines with close cut of points of Hampson Hampson design. The original lines laid down in 1899. Further mm, modifications carried out on uh, April 25th. Uh, hey, that, that's, uh, that's funny. Uh, train stopped at the station. <laughs> Nothing ever stops here. There's something, uh, something very wrong there. Uh, must be something very wrong. Back in the station, the train had stopped. The groom slipped out onto the platform. He headed for the tool chest and was amazed to see that it no longer contained a body. They'll go in the signal box. It must be him. Right. Holding the Tommy gun at the ready, the groom hurried up the line. In the signal box, Mrs. Peel was insisting that she should be told the complete truth. Look, if someone important is traveling on this line, I have a right to know. Now, is it today? Tonight. But who is traveling tonight? I must... Ah! Mrs. Peel had leapt at old crew, knocking him over into safety. But George Warren lay on the floor, dying. Mrs. Peel crawled over to him. Who is it, Warren? Who's traveling this line tonight? Prime Minister. Mrs. Peel and old crew only just managed to get to the train before it started to pull out. In the corridor, they paused to get their breath. Oh, I, I still don't see why you had to pull me along. You're my only ally, the only one I can trust. Well, that's extremely kind of you. But... Look, all the others are dead or missing. My dear lady. I fear that my services would be to no avail at all. You're getting a ride on a train, aren't you? How could you turn your back on no, that? No, that? That is true, of course. Um, yes, sir, this is a nice example of the five oblique stroke seven seven top carriage. Yes, well, let's go into details later. Yeah. We must sign Steve. Come on. I'll start here. You follow the ticket collector. Ticket collector? Uh, then what? Watch him. See what he does, where he goes. And come back and tell me. Off you go. <laughs> But the ticket collector and the groom had retired beyond the restaurant car to the galley, which turned out to be more a chief operations room than anything else. We'll keep this door locked from now on. Only those who give the correct signal are allowed in. Are you comfortable, Mr. Steed? John Steed was handcuffed by one hand to a steel chair. I have been worse. I thought you should witness the final phase. I thought it might amuse you. Oh, but it isn't of you. Yeah, it's for me, really. A coup isn't a coup unless someone is there to see it. Someone to impress. I'm afraid I shan't be able to applaud with these handcuffs on. Still, I can shout to uh, author if that'll help. The look in your eyes will be enough. Apathy? Agony. You see, I'm going to kill your prime minister. The presumption. How do you know which way I voted? I'm not considering your politics. Merely your patriotism. It's greatly exaggerated. I think not. Our trains will pass at about 8.57. And then you will hear the Big Bang. Mrs. Peel, searching for the missing John Steed, had called at Chase Halt to enlist the help of old crew, the self-appointed owner of the station. They hadn't got a lot further forward, and another special security man, George Warren, had been killed. But the train from Norborough had made an unscheduled stop at Chase Halt, and Mrs. Peel had bundled old crew aboard. They'd begun a systematic search of the train, hoping to find Steed. But Steed was held captive in the galley, firmly handcuffed to a steel chair. The ticket collector, who turned out to be the arch-villain of the piece, was explaining to Steed how he intended to kill the Prime Minister. Yes, Mr. Steed, 8.57. At that time, we'll be running through Durbridge Station. Durbridge, population 2,413. Principal industry, manufacturer of glass eyes for teddy bears. Fame, non-existent. But after tonight, there won't be a person in the civilized world who hasn't heard of it. After tonight. After I've pressed this button at 8.57. The ticket collector's hand hovered over the button. A bomb, Mr. Steed. Your prime minister is sitting on a bomb. Activated from this train. You'll press the button as the train starts. At top speed. We shall be a mile away by the time it explodes. <sighs> the end of a hard road. A long road. 21,214 miles to be exact. Shuttling back and forth. 
Mobile headquarters. Ingenious. Defies detection. Nice way to make contact as well. Our agents merely board a train. What could be more innocent? Very ingenious. Just another few miles, Mr. Steed. That's all. Old crew, out in the corridor, had been trying to find the ticket collector. He followed an attendant who approached the restaurant car and gave a knock that was obviously a signal. Old crew advanced, tried the handle of the door. It was locked. Crew thought he'd better find Mrs. Peel and report. Whilst inside the restaurant car, the attendant walked through to the galley. It could be trouble, sir. What do you mean, trouble? We're almost there. It's the uh, woman who lost five pounds there. What about her? She's on the train in compartment 4767. Oh, I see. A friend of yours, Steve? Yes, very good friend, actually. Well, we must take care of her. The bride is still on the train, isn't she, Groom? Next compartment. Splendid. I'll talk to her. The collector turned to some rather complicated mechanism that stood on a table near the bomb button, fiddled with it, and spoke into a small microphone. The bride, in her compartment, heard an urgent whisper from the air vent above her head. We have an enemy in the next compartment. The woman who is always prying upon us. See to it. Kill her now. The bride seemed to show no surprise at all. She merely got up, took an automatic from her handbag and slipped into the corridor. Mrs. Peel appeared to be dozing when the door of her compartment stood open. Oh, so it's you. It'll be a pleasure. The bride leveled the gun. Mrs. Peel swung an elegant leg and kicked the gun out of her hand. As though with a continuation of the same movement, Mrs. Peel launched herself across the compartment, butting the bride squarely in the midriff with her head. Thoroughly winded, the bride collapsed. Mrs. Peel grabbed her and threw her into the corridor. You would have done better to have stayed in your do not disturb compartment. So I think if we tuck you under the seat, you might stay out of trouble. In the operation galley of the train, the ticket collector had heard the sounds of the attack and realized that the bride had got the worst of it. John Steed grinned. Hooray! Bravo! Oh, sorry. My patriotism hasn't got the better of me. I, I do apologize. Groom, you'd better go and deal with things. A pleasure. Nothing but a pleasure. <laughs> the groom left the galley, pausing only to pick up what looked like an innocent tray of tea things. Meanwhile, old crew had found Mrs. Peel storing the bride under a seat. Uh, Mrs. Peel! Mrs. Peel! There are rules about these things, you know. Well, just keeping British Railways tidy. What happened? We had a difference of opinion. We didn't agree. Uh, what about? Well, whether she should shoot me or not. How are you, crew? Oh, Mrs. Peel, Mrs. Peel. Bum, diddy, bum, 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 bum. Hmm. I like it. It's catchy. I can't see it making the top ten. Oh, no, no, no. You, you don't understand. The dog in the restaurant. The one that leads you to the galley. It's locked. But there's a special knock to get in. Don't tell me. Let me guess. Boom, diddy, boom, boom. Boom, boom. Right, stay here. Keep an eye on the bride and leave this to me. Mrs. Peel made it to the restaurant car in double quick time. She approached the door. Boom, diddy, boom, boom. Boom, boom. See? The groom stood in the doorway. He held a tray in one hand, the teapot on the tray with the other. The spout of the teapot pointed straight at Mrs. Peel. A teapot gun. Dinky little things, really, isn't it? Very effective for hold-ups in cafes, trains. Things where orthodox guns are a bit obvious. Do back up, dear lady. I'm afraid you've been the teeniest bit too inquisitive. Shouldn't you be at a wedding or something? Oh, that's just a disguise, a cover. They call me the groom. A session with me and people forever hold their peace, so to speak. Fascinating. I have a compulsive death wish. Other people... Really? Uh. Mrs. Peel made a sudden movement backwards. The bullet from the teapot gun missed Mrs. Peel by a fraction of an inch. It shattered the glass of the window behind her. Vandalism. But it should show you that I mean business. Open the door. The door? Yes, that one. The outside one. Much nicer if your death looks like an accident. An unfortunate fall. <laughs> Funny, really, being cast as a groom when at heart I'm really an undertaker. Now, let's get this over with. Mrs. Peel appeared considerably affected. She swayed as though about to faint. Oh, dear, the weaker sex. What? Mrs. 
I see you delivered a beautiful uppercut. The teapot gun flew out of the open doorway. The tray crashed to the floor. Mrs. Peel waded in. The groom grabbed. A little struggle attempted to push Mrs. Peel through the door. She replied by bringing her knee up viciously. The groom doubled up, tried to regain his balance by reaching for the door. He missed, tottered on the brink, and fell out of the carriage into the night. <laughs> Man, I think. Mrs. Peel reached out and grabbed the door, pulling it closed. Oh, Mrs. Peel, Mrs. Peel, don't you know it's extremely dangerous to lean out of a train while it's in motion? We're not quite finished with danger. The restaurant car. They made their way to the restaurant car. The door had been left open. The train roared on into the night. Do you happen to have the right time, Mr. Peel? I make it uh, 8 55. Another couple of minutes and the two trains will pass. We're running right on time. Splendid. The corrector removed the cover from the bomb button. His fingers tapped on the table. He could hardly keep from pressing the button prematurely. Mrs. Peel, moving through the restaurant car to the galley, found herself facing one of the attendants. She said, Evening. And hit him. Watch out, Steve. The other one's got a gun. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Steed gripped the steel chair with his handcuffed hand and swung it at the other attendant. The train! The train is coming! The button, there are the button, the bomb! Emma Peel sprang forward, grabbed a wire mesh in tray and inverted it over the button. The ticket collector thrust her finger through the mesh, trying to press the button. Oh, no, no, no! It's now, now! The time is now! John Steed got an arm round the ticket collector's throat and pulled him steadily away from the control panel. The other train roared by and vanished into the night. Oh, the danger's passed. The ticket collector collapsed in a heap. And at that point, old crew entered. The communication cord! Pull the communication cord! Yeah! Oh! Old crew pulled that communication cord. About ten yards of the stuff came away in his hand. Oh, modern trains! They don't build them like they used to. Disgusting, I call it disgusting. Delightful, Steve. Plenty of traffic on the road. Yes, people should drive more carefully in this wet weather. <laughs> there you are. You Look at that idiot. We could park the car over there at the railway siding. Look what that poster says. Hmm? It's safer, safer by, by rail. rail. <laughs> <laughs>